Thank you, Samantha. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Perkins. I work for Saudi Americas, and we want to uh, send an appreciation out to all of you guys that are attending and sitting online with us this afternoon. Um, we want to definitely make sure that you guys know that Saudi is essential, and we are open for business along with uh, the industry and helping to try to move forward the best way we can. So we thank you for business, and hopefully the pre-press process here will help enlighten you to a, maybe a new or better way of doing things. So here we go. It's a short index of the topics and things we'll be going over. Saudi is a multinational company that develops, produces, and commercializes highly advanced technical fabrics and chemicals for industrial use. Saudi is active in four areas of application, printing, chemicals, filtration, and protection. Each has an independent production process, but all supported by the name, <clears throat> same innovative thinking that Saudi know-how, unique for its scope and resources. What we do at Saudi, we manufacture monofilament fabrics, multifilament fabrics, conveyor belts, ermid fabrics, also known as Kevlar, fabricated filtration parts, screen printing emulsions and chemicals, and screen printing equipment. Saudi, as you know, is one of the leading world's largest mesh manufacturers, and we offer mesh in two ways, twill weave and plain weave. And here's some of the differences. In mesh counts 305 to 508, two types of weaves are available. Twill weave will achieve a heavier ink deposit versus where plain weave will achieve finer detail. Now, shown in the illustrations to the right, you'll see a distorted printed dot with the twill weave, and then also to the right of that, how the twill weave is woven. The bottom illustration shows a cleaner, crisper dot, and also the illustration to the right of it shows a one over one under woven fabric, meaning plain weave. Thread counts. This is the nuts and bolts of mesh manufacturing. If you'll notice the illustration on the left, the detail equaling one mesh opening. The second illustration shows the detail equaling two mesh openings plus two threads. For anyone trying to achieve fine simulated process and finer detail, you will always want to target two mesh openings plus two threads because the smallest detail should equal the two threads and two mesh openings. Thread diameter. In mesh count 61 to 508, you may have a different thread diameter to choose from. Thin threads achieve greater detail, but are weak. Thick threads are very strong, but cannot achieve the fine detail. The illustration shows here on the 305 mesh at a 31 micron, 34 micron, and 40 micron shows the difference in the percentage of open image area. And that basically is the amount of area that your dot and ink have to flow through. The bottom illustration shows the proper selection of thread gives a clean, crisp edge definition to where the thicker thread with the improper mesh openings leaves a chattered, jagged edge. These are micro photographs of print samples of the 305 mesh. The top left shows the 30540. The center is the 30534. And then to the right is the 30531. And the 30531 basically is the introduction to the hydro mesh. Yes, it's the thinner woven technology, but if you look at the bottom illustration, it'll show you the quality and print difference. Going from the left to the right shows the 40 micron thread with very little area for the dots to fall in print. The center being the standard as we knew it, being the 30534, and then the illustration to the bottom right, that is the hydro. Color. We all know mesh to be either white or yellow, or in Saudi's manufacturing, sometimes orange. But the white fabric exposes twice as fast as dyed. This is needed for the projection and poor light sources. Dyed fabric has the capability of holding finer resolution. Dyed fabric also, due to the longer exposure times, gives you a greater latitude. You'll notice the white fabric tends to choke dots to where 
the reflection of the, the light and the white mesh tends to scatter. That's where the dyed fabric gives you a, a stronger sense that the fabric will help not choke out the dots and give you a cleaner, crisp edge definition. I'm going to get into some tensionings of the fabric. Each fabric holds a different guideline or set for tension levels, different types of tension, tension, stage, rapid, and pulse. As you know, each mesh count will hold different tension levels. Getting into the way we stretch the stage, there's five different uh, targets here. You're going to do 25% of the target, wait 10 minutes. You're going to retension up to 50% of the target, wait 10 minutes. Tension to 75% of the target, wait 10 minutes. Then we're going to do 100% of the target and then wait another 15 minutes. After this is done and relaxed, you'll retension back to the target of the specific mesh count you're targeting, and then you'll either glue or send that roller frame over to reclaim for mesh prep. The stage tensioning pros and cons. As we all know, the, uh, this, the pros creates the most stable printing screen available. Minimum tension loss over time and can be performed on any type of stretcher. The cons, done, to, done correctly, can take up to an hour. Done incorrectly can make the fabric brittle. This may only yield an additional Newton for some small for format printers. Rapid tensioning, which tends to be what everybody wants to do these days, but obviously there's some downfalls. So these guys tension 100% of the target within 10, or 10 to 30 seconds. With the pneumatic system stabilized for 10 to 20 minutes and then they glue the screen. With a mechanical stretching system, they check the tension and retension if necessary, five minutes. And at the fourth stage of the tensioning, they stretch it, glue it, and send it. The pros and cons to the rapid tensioning. As I had mentioned before, screen stretchers, they like it because it's the fastest way to stretch a screen. Adequate, adequate results for the smaller floor print. The cons, usually more tension loss over stage tensioning method. It requires a good quality stretcher. This graph shows you tension loss over time after gluing. So if you look on the, on the left, it shows that all the stage time started at 25 Newtons and those dropped over a period of 48 hours, anywhere from five minutes to 120 minutes. The mesh preparation. As we all know, mesh is an inert plastic, polyester, with poor adhesion qualities. Emulsion is a water-based product and does not stick to plastic well. Degreaser removes grease from the mesh and reducing fish eyes, but not, does not help the adhesion. For the optimum adhesion results, you must use a mesh prep. This illustration shows the Saudi mesh prep on the left versus a standard degreaser only. You'll notice on the illustration on the left that the emulsion still stayed adhered to the mesh when underexposed. The illustration to the right shows the emulsion did not stick to the mesh. You'll notice the clarification on the 21 step strip there, clearly underexposed. Here we'll talk about the functions of a stencil. This is also related to as the image or art that you're trying to print. Reproduction of the image to be printed, to be resistant to abrasion and chemicals, modifying the thickness of an ink deposit. And what this means is a small detail only, you could reduce the, the stencil thickness to create a better dot. And it also controls the, the print edge definition. The majority of photo stencil types, some of you may not be familiar, but early days it was all indirect film, and then capillary film, and then your direct emulsions. I would say probably 75 to 80 percent of the screen printers out there are using a direct emulsion for ease of use and cost, durability. Here's the features of an ideal emulsion that we would all love to have. High solid content. Super fast exposure, 
a wide exposure latitude, solvent resistant, easy reclaim, high resolution, pinhole free, and water resistant. Sounds like the perfect product. The direct emulsion choices are as follow. You have a diazo. which is a very good product for probably 50 years ago. It's least expensive exposure. Newer to the industry would be the dual cure. It has a great resolution, a wide exposure latitude, medium speed exposure, and it can be solvent and water resistant. The pure photopolymers, which is everyone's choice because of the ease. There's no mixing, it has a longer shelf life, and it's fast exposing. The newer emulsions that have surfaced in the last few years are hybrid pure photopolymers. They're offering us the benefits of a dual cure and a pure photopolymer. This particular product would do water-based plastisol and discharge. Here we'll talk about some variable coating techniques. Typically there's two involved here, manual and auto. The manual coating is inexpensive, generally how we all start out. It's compact, you can store that coater pretty easily. However, it does require some skill and patience. It can be the least reliable, and we tend to find that about 80% of the people out there are doing this wrong. The advantage to an automatic coder, it is the most precise, consistent screen available. Anyone can press the button and have, have all the uh, screens consistent and repeatable, consistent printing results, the easiest process to train any staff, and however it is more expensive. Here's where we get into the profiles of a stencil, which is your emulsion. The stencil profi profile equals the EOM, which stands for emulsion over mesh. The stencil roughness of the emulsion with the substrate side, we call this the RZ value. And if you look at the substrate, or the illustration, the, the bottom one, automotive glass, circuit board, pen, pencil, or a megaphone for that matters. Uh, the squiggly lines and dots is the mesh. The light blue is the emulsion. So the thickness of the blue is the EOM or the profile and the waviness of the bottom where the emulsion touches the substrate is what we call the RZ. The, the emulsion over mesh variables. This contributes to ink deposit at the edge of the stencil. This lifts the mesh from the substrate, allows ink to flow for finer detail, prevents broken lines and split dots. And your EOM should measure between 10 and 20% of the mesh thickness. And that thickness also depends on whether you're doing water-based, plastisol, UV, or conventional. That could vary. The RZ, meaning the stencil roughness, controls the edge definition, it minimizes the saw toothing, and under 10 micron is ideal. It is most important with the graphics, automotive, circuit board guys, and the higher EOM will always contribute to a lower RZ. Here's two devices that we use on a regular basis to do an audit in the screen room for the stencil thickness, that's your EOM, and the RZ meter. Now, these two tools aren't widely used. We do like to use those to um, kind of get the printers and the customers to acknowledge where they're at and where we can make improvements. Here are some factors that affect the EOM in the order of effect. The coating sequence. Always coat the substrate side first, the squeegee side last. More coating passes on the squeegee site result in a thicker EOM. Face coating builds thick, thickness slightly, but more importantly reduces the RZ. The coating speed, slower is better and builds EOM quicker. Coating too fast creates bubbles in the mesh leading to pinholes. And as a wise man once always said, if you think you're coating too slow, then slow down. Coating trough radiuses. 
A 0.5 millimeter is used for face coating, which most textile guys wouldn't do, but most graphics guys or electronics guys would. The one millimeter for most coating procedures is standard. And for guys coating really coarse mesh, they would use a 1.5 millimeter to achieve the heavier deposits. The coating pressures. These only factor in the importance of drying the emulsion on the screens. Diazo and Dupier emulsions will not properly cross-link unless fully dry. Diazo molecules will cross-link with water in the screen and cause pinholes during the run. And always remember that water, the emulsion would rather cross-link with water than itself if it's not dried properly. Fans in the screen room are generally discouraged. Dry to touch does not, does not indicate the proper drying. Flat, fans blowing debris on the wet screens. If the humidity is 90% in the screen room, then that's as dry as your stencil will ever get. Air, air is needed, generally around 30% relative humidity. So dehumidifiers into air conditioners are always recommended. And if you have the ability to have a drying cabinet with air exchange, that would be ideal. Additional problems with damp screens. If you're running a dual cure, you can easily get diazo staining. Poor stencil quality. Reactions between ink and stencils on press, causing staining to lock up. This is not exclusive to diazo-based emulsions. 